Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to Tales of Tech live on YouTube. Okay, we're officially in site refresh season. Two times the charm. <laughs> and um, we got a random launch of the M3 MacBook Air yesterday. I don't think it's worth it. You're welcome to disagree. But at least the people who do disagree will know exactly why, which is kind of, I think, what a lot of people need to hear. A firm, convincing opinion that just says, you know what? This isn't worth it. And at least if you disagree, you're going to know exactly why it's worth it in your mind. But a lot of people were probably on the fence and had no idea um, if they should get one or not. And uh, I think for the vast majority of people, you don't need to get one. Don't worry about it. Don't think about it. Um... But one of the more interesting comments that Apple made in their newsroom post, because of course they didn't have an event, there wasn't too much um, mentioned in regards to, <laughs> they didn't even like give it a new wallpaper. It was just like, hey, it's got the M3 chip now. Um, no event then, disappointing. I think the event would have been more disappointing because then you would have built it up even more in your mind. And then we would have watched the event and been even more bored. So site refreshes for minor spec bumps I think are very appropriate. I always think it's a waste of time to get people's hypes all out of control and hype it up like it's going to be this next big thing. Oh, we'd like to formally invite you to this next big event. And then you go, oh, we put a new chip in the same design as before. Um, yeah, it, it, the event could be just as disappointing, if not more so, to be honest. Um, but Apple made some interesting AI comments uh, that they haven't made before, even though... There's not really much. Uh, <laughs> there's not really much that's changed on the hardware end. The M3 chip is not new. It's been around for months. Same thing with the three minute, three nanometer architecture. Same thing with the neural cores. Um, but I thought I'd read them because um, who was it? Yeah, Marnjel was asking about this. Good to see you in the chat. Hello, hello. Good afternoon. Um, Apple's wording here was interesting, and because I was mainly just focusing on. Let's not let's not act like the M3 MacBook Air is worth it, especially when it's so similar in design and features to the M2 MacBook Air, which Apple is still selling, and you can find refurbished for even cheaper. But even if you don't have certified refurbished in your country, M2 MacBook Air is so affordable. But this was kind of an interesting choice of words Apple made, so I thought we could read it together. They're calling this the world's best consumer laptop for AI which they've never really used terminology like this before, but I think it gives us a sneak peek of what's to come at Dub Dub. Uh, with the tra here, since I might be reading this for a while, I'll put my face on the screen. There we go. With the transition to Apple Silicon, every Mac is a great platform for AI. M3 includes a faster and more efficient 16-core neural engine, along with accelerators in the CPU and GPU to boost on-device machine learning, making MacBook Air the world's best consumer laptop for AI. Leveraging this incredible AI performance, macOS delivers intelligent features that enhance productivity and creativity so users can enable powerful camera features. Camera features. What, continuity camera? Accessibility features and much more. With a broad ecosystem of apps that deliver advanced AI features, users can do everything from checking their homework with AI math assistance in GoodNote 6 to automatically enhancing photos in Pixelmator Pro to removing background noise from a video using CapCut. Wow, Apple dropping the CapCut. <laughs> Combined with the unified memory architecture of Apple Silicon, MacBook Air can also run optimized AI models, including large language models and diffusion models for image generation locally with great performance. I would like to know which apps they're using, but in addition to on-device performance, MacBook Air supports cloud-based solutions. Wow, what a, what a shock. The MacBook Air has internet access, enabling users to run powerful productivity and creative apps that tap into the power of AI, such as Microsoft Copilot, Microsoft 365, Canva, and Adobe Firefly. So that's relying on other people's uh, large language models. But that kind of comment about using the neural core on Apple Silicon to run large language models, I think is kind of giving us a hint of, whoops, let me switch that back. Uh, there it is. It's kind of giving us a hint of what's to come, um, which brings a lot of questions for what the future of Apple software is going to look like. Um, I know. Sometimes, I apologize. Sometimes I forget to switch the stream key over. So whenever I switch the stream key over or forget to, um, it live streams some old, uh, on Telos of EV, it, it's live streams some old title and thumbnail. And apparently the oldest one it can find is from Battery Day. 
Um, so it live streams like that when I have the wrong stream key enabled. I, I've, I'm usually pretty good at that, but today I slipped up and I live streamed to the wrong channel. But I've fixed it now. Yeah, app, <laughs> AI is the new 5G. That's honestly what it feels like. Um, Apple used to never use the word laptop, right? Um, yeah, there's been a lot of questions about this, some of which that even apply to me. Uh, Marnjel Pri asked a question because he's a Talos of Tech Pro member, and he writes... It's very likely that Apple will release some new generative AI features for iOS and presumably macOS too, according to the rumors. But we also know that some of Apple's most loyal users are artists and other creators. And among my niche of creator friends, at least, we are openly against generative AI. So with this in mind, do you think Apple will limit their generative AI features compared to Google and OpenAI in, or in order to not anger their creative users? Also a bonus question, but do you feel concerned at all about generative AI replacing you? In my view, AI-generated content may likely never be as good as content made by humans, but for big media companies, I think they just have to come close enough to the quality in order for them to start replacing creators. Wow, what a topic, what a subject. We could probably talk on that for hours and hours and hours. Um, and then Jeremiah says, what wallet are you currently using? Same wallet, still Ridge Wallet. I've been a Ridge Wallet user for six, seven years now. Anyway, uh, I think that and AI is often looked at as it's going to exponentially get better over time. And it's almost never true from what I can see. And I've, you know, some people disagree with me on this and I encourage you to disagree with me in the chat. Tell me why I'm wrong. Explain to me how I'm wrong because I want to learn. Uh, even if I'm wrong, I want to learn why I'm wrong. Um, but I've watched a lot of AI projects over the years where they'll take very noticeable big leaps and bounds improvements but then they kind of level off. People expect the progress to go like this, but instead it's a bit more like this. It's a bit more of an S curve where occasionally you stumble onto something that results in a big leap in performance, but then it levels off and doesn't really improve to the point of replacement of a lot of jobs. Uh, I have family members and friends in the software engineering field. Neither of them are that scared or that worried about chat GPT. Um, they've used them, they've tried them, they say they, they're useful and kind of handy tools sometimes for writing notes or accumulating things or kind of breaking a subject down, but it's never reached the point where the large language models get so good that you can replace entire roles, entire jobs, because um, AI bots can be inconsistent where they say one thing with the exact same circumstances as another um question, but because it's been trained differently or because humans have been messing with it too much, it can actually get dumber and be a little bit too inconsistent. Uh, Michael Martell says, uh, you're spot on with your AI take. <laughs> I, I've watched it happen with Tesla's and full self-driving years ago when they were developing their neural nets, which is very similar technology with machine-based uh, learning. Um, they expected it to continue to grow and grow in performance. And instead, you know, it occasionally has these big spikes where, wow, okay, it made a lot of progress, but then it levels off. Um, you know, the version 12 of full self-driving was supposed to be this big, like, now it's nothing but neural nets. Now there's no more manually written code. It's all just AI writing itself at the whole point. And within a couple of weeks, it, it had a a collision in a parking lot. Nothing major, not like a high-speed collision, but they had to halt the rollout of version 12 because of this collision. So <laughs> it's like, okay, how do we improve it? How do we fix it if it's now completely neural net trained? It's not using any manually written code anymore. How do you improve it? I guess you just feed it more data, but I thought we had all the data. <laughs> I guess we got to keep feeding it data and hope for the best. Um, when AI becomes more innovative than humans, that will further accelerate AI development, creating an exponential curve. I, I'm waiting for that day to happen, but people keep talking about it like it's going to happen. But what I've noticed, especially with open AI, is you kind of reached a limit at the chatbot's capabilities, and then they shift their focus to something else. So once we started kind of capping out at the capabilities of GPT-4 and people start going, okay, you know what? All of the humans training it are actually making it a bit dumber. Um... It can only get so many things right. It's very impressive if it talks about fields that you don't know much about. But if you know much about the field, you'll find lots of mistakes and you'll find lots of errors with it. So instead, 
because GPT-4 kind of hits a limit and we can't really see it replacing that much more functionality, now they shift their focus to Sora. So now we're all talking about text to video capabilities and we see issues with that and limitations with that. And you can tell that it's AI generated, but everyone still has it on their mind. Oh, but in another five years, if this growth curve continues, it'll be next to perfect, but it never reaches perfect. It always gets close. It looks somewhat really good, but I feel like every AI project I've ever seen is always great at looking really close. Oh, what if this was a little bit better? What if they made it do this or that? And then they never quite get it there. Um, at least that's what I've seen. So I'm not personally too worried. I mean, there's definitely certain artistic uh, tools that are probably less in demand now because of AI features. Um, I could think of, uh, especially artists, if you draw for a living and we're hoping to make a, a living based on drawing artwork or painting things, uh, there's a lot of AI imagery that you can just crank out with a few bots and that kind of, you know, it definitely doesn't have the same touch or, you know, uh, what do you call it? In innovative look or or human taste as you know an actual human drawing or painting something but that is a field i see ai being pretty disruptive is uh, in um whereas in terms of my work uh you know sora just basically is launching now and it can't do videos longer than 60 seconds and that's primarily because they say the longer the video is uh the more distorted and the more ai looking it becomes um and I've tried to have GPT write my videos and I don't, I don't think it's very convincing. I don't think it's very good at it, um, uh, personally, but that's just me. So billions are being invested in generative AI projects. Some people seem more bullish on the subject. Yeah, I know because AI it's perfect for investment. I think, I think the technology is great at getting a bunch of investors on board because the prime investor is one that sees a bunch of potential that hasn't been realized yet. That's that's what an investor wants to put money towards. This product or this technology or this service is about to take off, is about to do something really crazy, but it's not quite there yet. So let me invest now so that when it blows up tomorrow, my investment looks really good. And that's how, honestly, Tesla was able to balloon their market cap over a trillion dollars was mainly getting a bunch of investors on board with the concept that our AI is going to develop this huge robo taxi fleet. And then our robo taxi fleet is going to make all the money and you won't need to think about the car business anymore. And they sold a bunch of them on that years ago and it didn't really go anywhere. It hasn't really happened. Um, so in the same way that open AI was able to raise a bunch of capital and get a bunch of funding really quickly, they come up with a feature that makes a very noticeable big step change and improvement for a chat bot. So it convinces a bunch of investors, oh, wow, this is about to take off. Imagine what GPT-7 or 8 is going to be like. And you expect it to be 20 times better, 50 times better. In reality, it's like 0.2 times better, 0.4 times better. And it never quite gets to the point um, of perfection. Um, we talk about GPT not getting better as if it wasn't released beginning of 2023. Imagine an iPhone improving as fast as AI did this year. I'm not trying to argue that AI doesn't make big step changes. I'm trying to argue that it's not always sustainable. You can't keep that rate of progress up for a decade. Uh, you'll Like I said, you, you make those big jumps, but that's it. They're a big jump and then it levels off in performance. And that's why you'll see people stop using it and then move towards some other project that makes another big leap like a Google Gemini. Now Google Gemini is where it's at. It can do more than GPT and then Gemini levels off and then we get bored with that. And then we start talking more about Sora with text to video. Um, so it's, as far as AI projects go, I think that it's never quite articulate enough or capable enough to completely replace a, a huge industry. I mean, this isn't, in a lot of ways, it's not exactly a new subject because automation replacing jobs is a conversation that goes back over a hundred years. Um, I remember classic example was the creation of the ATM. A lot of people thought that, uh, bank tellers we're basically all going to lose their jobs. There's going to be no need for b having bank tellers anymore because the ATM accomplishes the same task of the bank teller. Now I can go up to an automated machine, put my debit card in, 
put the money in or cash the check or get cash out of it. And boom, I'm done. I don't need to interact with a human anymore. So everyone thought, oh, well, bank tellers, that, that whole industry is going to die. Turned out the banking industry made so much money off of the convenience and simplicity of, of ATMs that because of all that mo extra money they generated, they were able to afford more bank tellers. Now there's actually more bank tellers than there used to be, and they just found new work for them. Now they can focus more on handling loans. Now they can have more in-person customer service at the banks for managing those loans and trying to get people on board with credit cards, uh, more people available to develop, you know, customized cashier checks and stuff like that. So there's all kinds of examples where we're worried about automation replacing a bunch of jobs, but then a bunch of new jobs or a bunch of new possibilities open up. It may not be the same jobs, but I think we're very, very short from a labor shortage. But yeah, automation does tend to disrupt certain industries. I don't think it gets to the point where everybody's job is replaced, but it, everybody's job does change a little bit. And I could visualize generative AI kind of helping me maybe in some way. I don't know exactly what Apple has in store for it, but I'm very curious and excited to find out. But personally, I would love it. I don't know if this is possible, but I would love it if uh, Apple GPT, whatever they end up calling it, I'm not using the S voice assistant because I don't want to set off everybody's devices. But what I would love is if generative AI could be used to analyze the way I edit my videos. And then I could just tell some, you know, intricate, complicated um, algorithm on my computer, edit my video for me. And it analyzes the way I edit a bunch and I can give them a bunch of samples. I'll say, look at the way I edited the last 40 videos I made. Analyze the technique, analyze the way I edit them, and now you edit them. And if the AI could start editing videos for me, okay, that helps me be more productive. It didn't really replace me, but... Now I can create videos faster. Now it doesn't take up as much as my time. But at the same time, I could imagine, okay, what if you're a full-time editor? What if you edit videos for a living and that's your full-time job? And now Apple comes up with a technology that replaces um, video editors or comes very close to being as good as a real professional video editor. Okay, yeah, I could visualize that kind of being more disruptive and resulting in more layoffs and that kind of thing. But again, it's... Especially in the creative field, you kind of have to be adaptable. You have to be adjustable. Um, good policy could go a long way in protecting certain industries from rapid churn. My fear is just that Microsoft and Google have such tremendous lobbying power. Okay, well, th this opens up to a different discussion, which is like, how do we get the government involved? See, personally, I don't think there's much point in prohibiting or limiting technology's growth, even if it's disruptive, even if it replaces jobs or results in layoffs. It's never worked long term. It's never been effective to try to ban certain technologies from coming out simply because we are trying to protect a certain number of jobs. I mean, the, there was an old example. In a lot of ways, like, like I said, this is not a new topic. Uh, there was an old example. I remember my dad and I talking about uh, the Pony Whip factory. There used to be factories that uh, would hire, you know, hundreds of people specifically to make little whips that would whip, you know, the ox or the horse or the ponies or the donkeys, whatever would carry your carriage. And that was a big industry of making those whips. So you could hit the animal to get it to move and haul you around. So when the automobile came out, there was this huge argument. There was this huge uh, public backlash of, well, this is going to drive uh, the the workers at the pony whip factories out of business. Now everybody's going to lose their jobs. So should we prevent the invention of the automobile to keep the pony whip factory running? You know, that kind of thing. Um, I don't know. I tend to think there's a lot of jobs that we're struggling to find humans for. And usually when you struggle to find humans to do certain jobs, you raise the wage for it because, of course, the demand for it grows higher and you need to incentivize more people to apply. Um so especially in the fast food industry, like there's a lot of fast food places that are not finding enough workers. So they raise their minimum wage. But the more you raise your minimum wage, the higher the budget becomes for automation. So now more and more engineering industries can come up with automated versions of cookware or uh, filling drinks, flipping burgers, uh, deep frying foods, whatever it is, whatever you can think of. Um, the budget grows higher, uh, the less people are willing to do it. So it's not like buggy whip thanks dad <laughs> i don't know why i said pony whip dad's still watching thanks 
Things don't work until they do. And my point is you can try to regulate it. You can try to make it illegal. You can try to say, okay, we can't develop AI past this point because it'll displace too many jobs, but that's only one country. Another country is not going to have those rules. And are you going to ban the software from that country from coming to your country? That makes it a whole different, that makes it a whole different discussion. Uh, so my point is, if we don't develop the tech, someone else will, because we don't have a world government. You know, we can't ban all countries from developing AI features. Um, and if, again, there's always, you know, industries or companies that work against the law or are not based in any particular country that try to make their software and services available to the masses. Just think of the pirating industry, how you can pirate things. It's not legal, but, you know, you can do it. Um and these companies can hide from it. So in the same way, if uh, Google and Microsoft get banned um, from developing more and more AI features that are more and more disruptive, then some Chinese tech company is going to do it anyway. And then we'll be at a severe disadvantage. Um, this is kind of what happened in the EV industry, to be honest. Um, the bank teller story is not true. Banks have less and less tellers. I should find the article I read about that. But my point is there are bank tellers. <laughs> a lot of people thought uh, banks would have basically no tellers at that point. But going to be some going the way of tool booth operators as a result of AI. Oh, toll booth. Yeah. He said tool booth. Plumbers are making bank right now. Yeah, that's true because there's not enough people that pursue those kinds of industries. Um, if Apple AI can help me cut out the dead air from my audio during video editing, then that is one scenario where I can see AI being useful as a creator. All kinds of software and technology has always improved things. I, I recall also a lot of stories about how Adobe Photoshop would kill the photography business. A lot of people thought, well, if you can Photoshop things now, now anybody can go out, buy a computer and make any photograph of whatever they want. How... Why would anyone need to take beautiful pictures anymore? You can Photoshop it to have a better sunset, to have a better... And I still know photographers, full-time photographers exist still, even though Photoshop has come and improved and gotten way, way better. Uh, and a lot of people thought, oh, what would be the point in hiring a photographer if anyone can access Photoshop? Drew pulling Oppenheimer here. It is, it really is. It's almost the exact same subject as uh, Oppenheimer, which is like we can't develop atomic weapons because they're too dangerous, but okay, if you believe that, then someone else won't and that country will get ahead of you. Um, it's very much true. Uh, bank teller only exists for old people that don't get the new tech. I've never done banking in person. I have when I needed to uh, create joint bank accounts when I got married, as well as when we got a mortgage for our house. Uh, it was helpful to have a bank teller in those processes. But yeah, for a lot of withdrawals and depositing cash, yeah, you don't need a bank teller anymore, but it's not sustainable is my main point. We, we can't prevent technology from making more efficient jobs or taking away jobs. That's just always happened. And I don't think it's very long lasting if you try to put regulations on it that say, no, don't do that because technology finds its way around those barriers anyway. Um, it's kind of the same thing with like uh, in Oregon, they used to, I don't know if they still do this, but in Oregon it was illegal for a long time to pump your own gas. And that was like mainly a job protection thing. So you literally just had to sit in the car and wait for someone to pump the gas for you. You couldn't pump the gas yourself. Um, they were one of the last states holding on uh, to that law. And then they just got rid of it a few years ago. But again, if a job does not bring actual inherent value, which can change uh, as technology improves and gets better, then yeah, it will it will not sustain itself because then it's just subsidized, essentially. Uh, do you think AI features will be limited to Apple Silicon Macs? At least not according to Apple's own statement here in their own newsroom post on how the MacBook Air is the best consumer laptop for AI. What's funny here is they talk about the 16-core neural engine. The M1 family of chips had 16-core neural engines. This one's a 3 nanometer one which means that it's faster and more efficient, but that does not technically mean that the Neural Engine is capable of doing things that the uh, other M1 chips don't already have. And they already said in this same post um, that, you know, Mac Macs are good for AI because of their powerful processing power. But they also mentioned iOS as well, saying iOS has neural core. You know, there's the same kind of neural cores in our A series of chips as well. So it's not it's not like just a Mac thing. I think, if anything, iOS would get more of the focus because... Uh, that's their most popular platform. 
Um, people who are upset about replace, uh, being replaced by an AR are usually the same sorts who never had a lot of empathy for blue collar job losses, to be honest. Yeah, there's been all kinds of job losses over the years, but I think it's important to acknowledge when you're in a creative industry that you don't have much job protection. Um, because demands change, uh, there's lots of competition in those spaces. So, I mean, in the artwork industry, and you could argue that content creation is somewhat of a art form or whatever, self-employment based on creating some kind of, uh, imagery, whether it be digital or physical, um, you have to be adaptable with the times, you know, I don't, I don't think it's Personally, I don't think it's the government's job to make sure that all of our art directions are always protected um, because uh, demand changes. And if there's a technology that can make it easier for a, a business or another company to come up with promotional material, um, think of it inversely. There could be a business that wants to come up with certain brands or logos or imagery or whatever that would go out of business if they had to hire humans but can stay in business if they can use AI and generative features. Now it's the inverse problem. Now it's, okay, well, if we ban AI, then that industry will go out of business, but the other people will. It's it's the ref playing the game too much. Government should be the referee, not a player. It's also terrible for the economy to have an excess of people laid off without relevant skills because it's a consumption-based economy, so people need work, disposable income. It's a balance. It is, but it's not going to be inherent valuable if it is replaceable is my point um because if they don't get it from companies here they'll get it from somewhere else um so it, it'd be better for the companies we have uh, domestically to actually invest in it or actually get better at it but again i all of this to say i don't think that ai is as job replacing as most people make it out to be um AI has posed some good challenges for me as a teacher. Essays and ChatGPT go hand in hand, so I've been trying other ways of assessment where I can, and it's been pretty fun. If I'm honest, if I'm honest, yeah, I've I have teacher friends as well that have said that students have tried to use it. Um, but that's the other interesting thing is they've mentioned that you can use ChatGPT to detect when students are using it. Um, also, I know teachers that say it's abundantly obvious when a student uses it because their vocabulary suddenly changes very drastically. Um, Dad says, I just ate at Carl's Jr. That hamburger might have been imp improved by an AI robot instead of a droopy $20 an hour worker. Not so good. <laughs> oh, man. Well, the consistency involved with it, too. Uh, I'm, just, I'm just pointing out that historically, we've never been able to stop with much success technology development. Because if there's not an inherent value brought from a human doing the work, then it will always get priced out. It will always be more expensive than the AI option, which will find its way in. Uh, another classic example would be like a bulldozer. You know, a technology came up with a way for one guy to operate a bulldozer so he could dig a big, di a big ditch or a big hole in the ground that's needed or, you know, move some dirt around for a foundation. Now, one guy can do the job that probably used to take 15 to 20 people. So do we ban bulldozers to protect that labor? I don't think so personally, because it's like, okay, well, you can ban all bulldozers in your country, but another country's still going to have them. And now they can develop, you know, building or housing faster than you can. Uh, so the price of keeping infrastructure more expensive is inhibiting a lot of the population versus just, you know, this is where tech is headed. We're going to have to adapt with it. Um, the thing with the art industry is that people who work there generally love the work they do. That's why they're against AI. You can't really say the same thing about uh, monotonous tasks like screwing a bolt in the assembly line. Uh, I don't personally, I mean, it's cool that they love what they do, but I would argue it's irrelevant whether or not they like what they do. I would argue it's like, well, it's, it's a job at the end of the day. Um, either way, a technology is capable of coming along and laying off jobs laying off workers should we not develop electric cars because it would drive the oil industry out of business <laughs> and then we'd lose jobs i don't know it's i think it's very it's it's very easy to be selective about it in my opinion um and again it's it's one nation we can be so i mean arguably we're not even really in that much control of what our government does our government moves very slowly but 
uh, overseas, we can't stop what they do. So if another country doesn't, are we going to ban um, AI projects from other countries? And then people can use VPNs anyway, and that'll be cheaper than hiring people domestically. So I, I think uh, I haven't seen AI or Sora do anything that makes me feel particularly threatened, but that could be because my job is somewhat intricate. It's not just one aspect. It's like, it's not just editing videos and posting them. It's about knowing what to say or how to put a funny spin on something. That's kind of how you give it a humanistic character to it. Um, but who knows, maybe my opinion would be very different if I was just a professional artist that drew for a living and just was like, you know, painting things and coming up with logos and graphic design. Maybe I would feel more threatened by AI and my opinion would change. Imagine the first construction job when the boss showed up with a circular saw. Oh yeah, true. Should we, should we ban the circular saws too? He's got rid of a lot of time with that, moving the saw back and forth. Uh... I found most successful fast food consistency in McDonald's and they were doing it way before AI or I guess public school intelligence rite of passage. Yeah, but like like was mentioned earlier, this is all still fairly new and there are a growing number of McDonald's locations that are no longer requiring um, cashiers to like work behind the counter. More and more of them just have screens and you can just go up and order that way. Uh, I mean, if you really are worried about any kind of jobs being replaced, then we should probably ban all smartphones. Think of how many jobs got replaced by the smartphone. The longer the laws take, the more freedom we have, at least for the time being. It's an artist's job to use the tool they have. We'll find a way. Right. So maybe artists have to get more creative with how they develop art and can now use AI to enhance the way they come up with uh, graphic design or give their clients more options or logos. And maybe you can serve more clients if you have access to generative AI for photos or videos. Um, you have to kind of stretch your business around. I mean, similarly, I, I guess I take issue with like a lot of, especially self-employed industries or, you know, independent contractors, assuming that someone else is responsible to make sure they have work. Like, I don't know, maybe people disagree with me on that, but I am self-employed. I am an independent contractor and I kind of run my business, <laughs> my little self-employment thing here. I run this knowing that nothing is guaranteed. I run this with no promises. You know, YouTube doesn't tell me that they will always give me an income. Um, that's my choice. There's, there's some pros and some cons to that. The pros are I'm my own boss. I can set my own hours and I'm in control of my content so I can say whatever I want. I can do whatever I want. And for the most part, no one's really going to stop me. I mean, there's other social ramifications. If you make content that's more cringy or more controversial or more embarrassing, maybe less people watch you and then you make less money, but it's all up to you, right? I understand that at any given time, YouTube could change their monetization program and say, actually, you know what? your channel's too small, you can't be monetized anymore. And then I would be at a loss of most of my income if they just change one policy. I accept that. I don't think the government should force YouTube to pay me no matter how poorly my channel does. I don't think YouTube should feel obligated or, or pressured to be like, you have to make sure that I have a paycheck every month. It's your responsibility. No, YouTube came up with a public platform with some policies and some guidelines that we all have to follow. But for the most part, it's pretty free will. We can kind of just talk about whatever we want. I can bash Google as a company. I can complain about their hardware and their software, and I can say it sucks and it's worse than Apple, and they don't ban me. So I, I still look at that as a fairly like accepting, fairly open platform. I know there's certain things YouTube doesn't allow that upsets people, but still, in the grand scheme of things, it's pretty, it's pretty nice. It's pretty flexible. Um, and uh, in my own personal life, as an example, uh, like my YouTube career got kickstarted because of tech videos. You know, I was not, I didn't one day decide, you know what, I want to be a tech YouTuber. No, I wanted to make movies initially. So I started uploading, not with the expectation that I would become a full-time YouTuber, but with the expectation that I could uh, go to film school and become a Hollywood film director. And, you know, I wanted to make theatrical movies that came out in the theaters and stuff. So I just started making short little movies with my friends and post them on YouTube. And then nobody watched them, of course, because I suck. I'm not a good actor and I'm not a great cinematographer either, which is fine. I've accepted that. But 
I put all this work and all this time and energy into developing little comedy sketches or action movies, and that didn't go anywhere. Um, so then I decided, okay, let me try making other videos and see if people want to watch those. So I tried doing gaming videos and I tried making music and I tried reviewing movies because I watched other YouTubers that did that and they had more success. And I tried all these things that didn't really go anywhere until the tech channel. Once I started trying to do tech videos, I found a demand. There was a demand for tech videos at that time and I could provide a supply. And at the time I started videos, it's a very different, you know, tech YouTuber space now, by the way, but at least when I started, there was not a lot of tech channels that were very openly biased or were like very Apple focused. There was a couple. I mean, there was like iJustine and everything Apple Pro, but at that time that was about it. So I wanted to do a more like daily uploading, maybe a bit more comedy focused um, Apple channel that went a little bit more on the offense about complaining about things they didn't like or uh, why Apple is better in some way, shape or form. And I found a demand, you know, that, that wasn't promised to me when I started uploading videos, I had to, I had to make that demand or I had to find a supply that there was a demand for essentially. And it took me many, many years, hours and hours of putting in work to find a demand that I could supply. Um, so once I got there, it grew pretty fast because there was some of the most interesting, fascinating tech news going around, particularly around smartphones. Uh, a lot of you guys yeah, are saying like, I remember back when you were in the attic days, I've been watching you since the attic. Yeah. A lot of people discovered my channel because of all of the rumors and leaks leading up to the launch of the iPhone 10, where we called it the iPhone eight back then. Right. And there was so many exciting changes within a single iPhone generation. Of course, there was a lot of hype. Of course, there was a lot of internet traffic based around what Apple was doing that year. Oh, they're going to switch to OLED. Oh, they're going to switch to Face ID. They're getting rid of the home button. They're going to switch to steel. They're going to have wireless charging. All of these upgrades all at once, that generated a lot of traffic, a lot of hype for the channel. So that's why I was able to grow it a lot. And I found a big audience during that time. And I think it's very clear now it's not the same thing anymore. Apple's not doing those kinds of drastic movements anymore where there's so many upgrades all at once. And now we're like, oh, iPhone 16 might have a new button, I guess. So like, is it Apple's responsibility to make sure that I have a job? Is it Apple's job to make their business interesting? Should they be forced to release a folding phone so I can have more videos to make to keep me employed? I don't think so, but I think it's a very similar argument you could make in favor. That's that's the point of the example is hopefully most of you would agree. No, that's ridiculous. Of course, Apple and YouTube is not responsible to keep me employed. But in the same way, as much as uh, I appreciate artists and, and I'm happy for anyone that's been able to make a career or a job out of, you know, artwork or drawing or graphic design and that kind of thing. It's not on, in my opinion, the government or any particular brand to keep you employed. It's up to you. You have to be dynamic about it. You have to be clever. And in the same way, uh, I, I will confess, I will attest, over the years, as Apple has become less and less interesting, there has been a noticeable de decline in the amount of content as, fo as far as Apple coverage goes that people are willing to watch because there's not as much to talk about. Everything is a slight iteration on what it was before. Oh, the chip got slightly faster. Oh, the display got slightly brighter. There's been a noticeable decline in watch time. So if I were to just sit there and keep making tech videos and expect more viewers to come, why aren't they coming? Why aren't more people watching? I used to make this much, now I'm making this much. What happened? This is Apple's fault? Is it YouTube's fault? No, it's just the industry changed. The technology changed. That's something technology almost always does, is adapt with the times. So I could just sit still and keep doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. Okay, I'm going to keep making iPhone leak videos. I'm going to keep making Apple coverage videos and expect for my revenue to stay the same or enough for me to stay afloat which of course is unreasonable because the tech changes and it gets less interesting over time and there's less people watching it, less people that care about it. So what did I do? I started expanding more into a different field that was, in my opinion, getting more interesting. In the YouTube space, you're kind of like in the hype business. You're following the hype. And wherever you think there's the most interesting technology development, that's, in my opinion, where you should go. And over time, over the past couple of years, I've spent more and more energy and money on 
electric vehicles because I found those more innovative. Those were more interesting than smartphones and laptops, which were all starting to blur together and all kind of sound the same. So I changed with the times as the technology changed, I shifted my strategy to where now most of my self-employment is from EV. The EV is my main focus now. Like that's my primary focus because that that's where there's more demand, more and more people watching EV content as they learn about electric vehicles. The growth in that is visible. I'm seeing it not with the smartphone and laptop coverage. So I shifted my focus with the times, which is just a, a more personal example of how I think artists and creators out there can adapt. And it's not always, uh, it's not always easy, but I think that, in those fields, you, you kind of have to be adaptable. Um, unless you're in an industry where they're promising you a pension or a certain amount of years of employment, then you, you might have a better uh, argument to be made as to why uh, the government should protect your job or whatever. But when it's just the technology's coming for my job, yeah, that, that I have a harder time wrapping my head around because it, it never lasts. Um, Let's see. I'm half and half. I could go either way with AI. I'm an artist as well, and I like the abilities and technology that goes into it and the ability to use them as references, but I see how it can be a little nerve-wracking towards other artists and how it could take away jobs, but I don't know. I'm impartial to it all. Yeah, I, I think you can be against it or you could be for it, but my point is there's no stopping it. It's Pandora's box. It's opened. Uh, you You could push Congress or push the government to regulate it, but they're probably not going to very effectively. And even if they did pass a law, you can't stop what other countries are enabling or unlock. If you create a demand for something and if there's a demand for a service, because which we're acknowledging here because it's capable of replacing a, a human in some way, uh, there's going to be demand for that service, whether it's domestic or international, right? So... Marnjell says, I, th I guess the question I have for open AI is what do they expect generative AI to be useful for? Like, who are they trying to appeal to besides investors? Oh, at everybody, right? Like, there's people that use uh, GPT to compile notes or summarize articles, that kind of thing, or look at something and explain, you know, how do I cook something? It's, it's basically the next evolution of a search engine. It's like a fancier search engine that understands context better. The same... The same use case of a Google Assistant or like, or a, you know, the Apple One, the Apple Voice Assistant or the Amazon Voice Assistant or the Microsoft Voice Assistant, all that stuff. It's mainly just to help people search the web. You know, should we should we stop Google from offering search options because it puts travel agents out of work? There's another industry. There's probably a lot less travel agents than there used to be because now I can look up flights and I can buy them all myself. Back in the day, before the internet, before search engines, how did you buy tickets? <laughs> a lot of people went through travel agents where they had to call the airline directly and get all these prices. So travel agent got a cut. Now, probably a lot less of them. <laughs> I don't know if, I, I still know there's a few travel agents left, but probably a, a, not as many as there used to be. Um, Let's see, I guess the question, Sorry, I just read that. I think EV is tech, though. You can merge both stuff, just like how Apple will never merge macOS and iPadOS. What? <laughs> you can merge stuff just like how Apple will never merge stuff? I don't understand. Hi, Sigualizer, by the way. Thank you for 27 months of support. I'm doing well. Thanks for asking. Unnecessary industries should be dealt with accordingly. Yeah, I've, I'm, unless if we had some giant world government that all agreed on things, then you'd have a point on you know, stopping the progression of certain technologies, but we don't. So if you don't develop it, someone else will. Um, OpenAI's goal is artificial general intelligence. They're jumping, making different AIs that do different things, then merge them into an AI that does everything a human can do. I, I don't know if that's their official mission statement, but I don't think it'll ever get there personally. But And what I find very interesting is when I talk to my software engineer friends that don't believe it's going to be that different. I think AI, just like all kinds of previous generation technologies, it's a tool. It helps with efficiency. It can make you more productive. Um, I don't think it's a fad. I hope people never um, understood my impression of it that way. I, I don't think it's like just the latest trend and it'll die off. No, it, it'll be around, but I don't 
I don't believe it'll replace as much as, I mean, a lot of people thought iPads were going to replace paper, you know, everyone thought, oh, with tablets and touchscreens, where the paper business is going to go under and we're never going to need paper anymore. And sure, I don't know, maybe paper consumption has gone down, but it's definitely not gone. There's still a lot of, put, there's still a lot of paper. Um, let's see. Uh, dictating all of this inside of Vision Pro, so my bad for the typos or sentence fragments. You went for it, and that's the penalty. That's only educational system accomplishment. I have certified audio and video production, and it's hard as heck, tedious. Shout out to everyone who pursues it. Yeah, it is. Um, that's kind of how the free market works. The hardworking and the people with great ideas get further ahead, and the people who aren't as creative or don't work as hard uh, or as smart don't move forward as much. Um, let's see. Would Apple's generative AI efforts be branded as another product or assistant, or could they use this as a moment to rebrand or re potentially replace, replace Apple's voice assistant entirely? Yeah, that's a good question. I would guess that generative AI would take a slightly different form. Um, if, if Apple comes up with AI features, just like Microsoft and Adobe has, then I, I think it would be more than just a voice assistant or just a chat bot. I think it'd be a little bit more than that. It might be a separate app or it might be a tool as a little option in the corner. Do you want AI to finish this keynote presentation? Do you want AI to develop a spreadsheet based on your previous spreadsheets? Or do you want AI to improve your video editing based on how these videos were editing or that kind of thing. I think there'd be a little bit more to it than just a chat bot. But yes, I, I could envision a maybe giving Apple's voice assistant, S-I-R-I, -I, <laughs> giving it a dedicated app where you can show photos to it or open the camera and say, hey, what is this? Or how do I make a meal with these ingredients or what have you? But more paper for more important paper use. <laughs> There you go. Um, yeah, back in the day, overheating pixels. Let's see. When the bus shows up with the circular saw is different than if just Joe Schmo showed up with a circular saw if he could afford one. Imagine the hazing that occurred. <laughs> yeah, someone had to be first, though, huh? Um, I'm always going to be in favor for the future. I hope this age is well. Progress has a price, and I hope no one I know or like has to pay too steep of one because I like you guys. Um, let's see. We've been using AI for a really long time in the creative industry. It's just now a topic because it is branded. Yeah, there's probably a lot of truth to that, Will. We use a lot of neural net training and all kinds of things. And again, it's a tool. Some, some tools can replace the whole jobs, but, um, that's, like I said, not a new thing. Um, let's see. <laughs> Imagine the crowd's reaction if they just called the AI God. Wow, that would be f fun. <laughs> uh, good story. As an unemployed software developer, that gave me hope. Thank you. <laughs> I I hope I can give people hope that, like, hope and also a dose of realism on just nothing in life is really guaranteed, you know? There's whether you're a software engineer, a audio engineer, or a content creator, or an artist, or whatever you are, there's there's no guarantees with any of these jobs, regardless of if you look at AI, or the job market, or whatever, that, you know, demand can change. And especially if the economy goes through a downturn, you got to be prepared for, you know, people to hold on to more cash and be less willing to spend it. And that could result in you having less income. That just happens. Um, dad says screen time in the fifties through the nineties was a whole new thing with a whole new effect with smartphones, new tech AI might be as different from phones as TV passed. Yeah. I, I think that's a great example of how just how new and how fast a lot of technology iterates, but like, like all technology, we can say it created a bunch of new jobs. I wouldn't have this job if it weren't for technology. You know, I don't, I don't know if anyone out there is just saying, okay, well, let's just prohibit technology from improving. Let's just go back to the Amish days. I think the Amish are onto something though. Every day. <laughs> I think, I think there's a, there's a simplistic way of life that there's something good about that 
for our souls or something, but that's a deeper subject. But my point is we wouldn't be talking right now if it weren't for technology advancing. And if we tried to prevent that, then who knows what kind of tech or developments or medical technology that could potentially save lives never gets stumbled upon. Um, nothing being guaranteed is the guarantee. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Um, I can't really figure out how Apple will implement generative AI. They usually do stuff differently, but I feel like other companies have products for a lot of use cases. Yeah, yeah. I Apple tends to find a way to make a lot of state-of-the-art tech more accessible and more simple to use for the masses, which I think might be just exactly what the AI industry needs is of like, we're going to break it down. Here's how the feature works. And then once Apple shows us how to do it, then everybody else goes, oh, yeah, like, thank you. Like, th that's how we should be doing this. Maybe it'll be a lot more simple to use than all of these other AI services. I don't know. But I tend to think it's a bit over-exaggerated. Sure, there are likely some aspects of AI capability that could replace jobs, but they were likely jobs that didn't have much security anyway. Like, I don't know. I... I know of some people that were pursuing jobs with graphic design or, you know, being licensed out to make paintings and murals and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, a lot of people who want big paintings done or, you know, can an AI, if, if the AI floods the market with that, then it becomes less valuable, I suppose. Um, but there, that, that job didn't have a ton of security anyway, because paintings or murals or that kinds of thing is, is usually looked at as a luxury, not a need, um, which means that it's easily affected by recession and, you know, economic downturn when people aren't willing to spend as much money. Now you have less income, that kind of thing. Um, let's see, technology advances, advancing forces me to buy a car and get into accidents. And I hate driving, but I have no choice. What forces you to buy a car and get into accidents? I'm trying to understand how that works. <laughs> if I feel like every time technology tries to make lives easier, it always does the opposite. I don't, I, I want to question what's forcing you to buy new tech. Flip phones are really cheap now. You could just have a flip phone and use it for calling and not have any social media. You're nothing stopping you from buying a really cheap cabin in the woods and growing your own food. You can go backwards if you want, dude. No one's, no one's making you buy all this stuff. <laughs> And usually cars are getting safer with more advanced uh, active safety systems and passive safety systems. We have some of the best airbag technology that's ever existed. Um, cars that will break automatically as they get closer to an object, that kind of thing. We got more cameras on our cars, so your visibility improves, that kind of thing. Who's forcing you to buy this stuff? <laughs> um, there's also a lot of cities that have public transport where you can bike and stuff. Maybe AI will take over some jobs, but skills will always be rewarded by the market. Yeah, I, I do agree with that, Ishiki. Um, but AI is not new in that regard. Technology as a whole has always, you know, replaced lots of jobs. It's because most U.S. cities are very cost-centric. Just look at not just bikes. Yeah, I know, I know that a lot of cities aren't, but my point is they, they are more likely to get you in accidents. Flip phones are for the Amish. <laughs> yeah. I think the bigger problem is you're, you're blaming a city controlled thing on a human demand thing. Humans want cars. Even when amazing public transportation is available, people still buy cars. That's, that's been proven all over the world. Um, you, you can find some areas where car ownership is lower because of great public transportation, but it's not zero. There's still going to be a demand for it. Um, but you know, some people make it work in different cities, but they tend to be more expensive. So pick your poison. You can live in a cheaper place where you have to drive around, or you can live in, a, live in an expensive place where you can walk everywhere. Which do you prefer? <laughs> but yeah, I, I know about the Not Just Bikes channel. I know there's, it's it comes down to a lot of the foundation of the country being built around freedom. So there's not as much planning that goes on because people buy land and use it the way they want. But Anyway, the marketing genius Apple is the best techie as a tech influencer. And sometimes it seems like them and us are the only ones that get it. Not cheesy to say as they do get company slash industry on board. I think 
the sooner you learn to adapt with the times, the more confident you'll be in your future. Like, I, I just wouldn't get too complacent with any job, really. I assume it's always going to be there. Um, Silicon Valley, expensive place, drive everywhere because you have to if you value your time. I know a lot of uh, bus systems that work there, too. But anyway, that's a whole separate. The public transportation is an endless. I mean, I agree with you for the record. I'm all in favor of more public transportation, but it's just the way the government is run. I, I wouldn't. It's kind of a hopeless uh, field to pursue, in my opinion, because it mainly just involves shaking your fist at a government and it doesn't really get anywhere. You just got to elect the right people. Into, oh, yeah, right. Because politicians, they solve problems, right? Um, anyway, it's a very depressing subject, I know. But that's what people wanted to talk about. And I don't know. I didn't feel... I feel like it was too big of a subject to do just one little video on. So it was kind of perfect for a live stream. But um, we can talk about other things for the record. But um, Brian Miller just asked, I just upgraded to 16-inch M3 Pro MacBook Pro and absolutely loving it. Wow. Think of all your neural cores, dude. Um, I, there was one other question about Max, but sorry, my dad just asked a question and I like when he's in the stream. He says, I've looked into property out in the woods, building a cabin and living off grid is a lifestyle choice, but it would not be cheap. Yeah, it probably wouldn't be cheap, but I mean, hey, you wouldn't have to be forced to buy all this. You wouldn't have a cell phone bill. You wouldn't have to pay for internet. You wouldn't have to pay for all these crazy expensive things. Um, Roll Sevens, I think is his name. Thank you for the question. He says, what's the next major upgrade for the Mac product line? New high-end monitor soon? I would guess the Mac Mini. I'm surprised the Mac Mini hasn't been touched in so long. Um, it's probably ready for an M3 chip. Honestly, we could get that tomorrow. For the record, we're in Apple site refresh season, which means at any time they can, usually in the mornings, earlier in the week. I'm kind of surprised they didn't do anything today. I thought they would drop something today, but um, I guess they dropped new iOS stuff. But um, it's like MacBook Air, we got that, and we know that there's iPad Airs in the works that'll have the M2 chip, and they'll have a new 12.9-inch size, and then we have uh, OLED iPad Pros as well. Um, they could update the monitors, but I don't know. They don't refresh those very frequently, so I wouldn't get my hopes up on the monitors. I know people are like, come on, put promotion on those things, but the problem is with the Thunderbolt throughput. It becomes a, a bigger headache if you're trying to pump 6K at 120 hertz through a little... Thunderbolt 4 port, but um, it's fear of the unknown. Right as time knocking it before you trying it refused. Our brains want ease, familiar, comfortable. Yeah, and and we just we never get it. Um, Mac Mini probably comes with new USB C peripherals. That would be a huge one. Please, can we just? I would celebrate any form of killing the lightning port. Can we get rid of the lightning port on more things? To me, it's still like criminal that they refreshed the iMac and didn't ship it with new Type-C magic accessories. Like, come on. Um, we are at a time where like 99% of people who are perfectly fine using laptops, smartphones, and smartwatches from three to five years ago. Yeah. Yeah, and it definitely dwindles the demand for tech content, that's for sure, which is why I've transitioned more to EV content. In case you weren't aware, my EV channel makes more than the tech channel by a pretty wide margin now. So that's that's where my focus has gone. See how I adapted? I didn't just keep making iPhone videos expecting that to always be the same. That's just my example. I know it's probably harder for different industries, but do you think Apple's goal is to have three products in total? Vision Pro that is as strong as a Mac and gains more capabilities. The iPhone becomes better than DSLR cameras and AirPods for the audio. Um, I don't know. I could still, I, I don't think point and click has gone anywhere. Using computers with keyboards and mice, you know, we've changed the, the way that looks. Now more and more people use laptops than desktops, but we still are using keyboard and mice and a Apple is still advertising how, Hey, with the new MacBook air, you can plug in external monitors and the external keyboard and mouse. So there's still desktop like setups. Um, that hasn't really gone away, but maybe it'll change. Maybe it'll get to the point where you wear a vision pro, but you have to carry around a keyboard and trackpad. So there's, there's a bit more peripherals to it. 
Um, I don't know. I don't think that's their goal. I don't think there's someone internally at Apple going, how do we end up with three products? I, I mean, ultimately, they want to make good products that enrich people's lives. And of course, they need to make a profit along the way. So that's really Apple's goal. You know, <laughs> make money, deliver cool products. Some people act like a, a business is evil for wanting to make money. No, that's just how a business works. You can't do anything without money. Uh, you know, for a business, a profit and cash is how they breathe. So saying a company only cares about money is kind of like me saying you only care about oxygen because all the day, every day, all you're thinking about is breathing. And it's like, well, yeah, I mean, I do care about oxygen and breathing, but uh, there's other things. I care about my loved ones or I care about my hobbies or my interests. And, you know, you can care about people and still be like, yeah, but I would like to breathe. Breathing is important. Um, Type C MagSafe battery plug. Yeah, really. So far, no peripherals. I'm 100% Vision Pro only. You got to keep going to Vision Practice. How do you expect otherwise to become a Vision Pro? Oh, wow, Mark. That was good. Um, Nathan says, I'm still rocking a 14-inch M1 Pro and iPhone 13 Pro and have no need to upgrade anytime soon. Those are awesome machines. Yeah, I feel similarly about my hardware. They're still, for the most part, running great other than the stupid iOS bug I ran into yesterday where once again, the camera stops recording for no reason, but I have reported it to Apple. I, I think I've got it escalated within the company. I don't know if I'm supposed to be sharing that. <laughs> anyway, I included the log files for this, the bug and submitted it to the software team. So I'm hoping that someone at Apple takes a look at it. Um, but yeah, I don't really see a world where AirPods get replaced by anything. Pretty sure AirPods are here to stick around. I feel pretty confident about the iPhone as well. I I think that the iPhone already has become very much a camera more so than a phone. Case in point, how I'm using my phone right now as a camera. And I, I feel like everything else, though, is up for grabs with this whole spatial computing concept. I could see tablets kind of going away maybe even smart watches if you're if you're wearing something comfortable enough on your face you could just do this and it placed all of the widgets and stuff on your watch but i don't know it's kind of hard to kill apple products you know when was the last time apple just stopped making something the ipod that was around for quite some time and it took a while even though everyone was like why are they still making ipods they kept going for quite a ways and iPhones had to get pretty affordable before they felt comfortable killing it off. Um, a mouse still has its place over trackpads, especially with drag and drop. A little difficult to click and hold on something like folders and open windows and dragging them far across the screen. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Same with like, I mean, the Vision Pro is cool and all with the eye tracking and the hand tracking. But I personally don't think that this whole thing where I'm controlling the computer with my eyes and pinching... I don't think that will ever replace completely the concept of a touch screen and a keyboard and mouse. Those are just too practical, too efficient to ever completely go away. Um, maybe the eye tracking and hand tracking gets better. I'm not saying it'll die off, but I just don't see it replacing that much. Um, I have a theory. What if we are getting an event, but near the end of the month, the same thing happened back in October. Rumors said no event, but at the end of the month, then there was. I don't know. I think usually last second, Mark Gurman's pretty accurate, and he's saying that they're not planning an event. Um. So I I tend to believe him. They also said that there's a uh, site refresh coming, and then there was a site refresh coming. So if it's anything like Apple's done in the past, I think it's more likely that this week we got the air. Maybe next week we'll get iPad Air and iPad Pro, and maybe that'll be it. I don't know. Um, let's see. And what if M3 MacBook Air launching yesterday was mostly just to drive attention away from the EU ruling statement? <laughs> it's possible, but you got to keep your tinfoil hat on because now we're making wild guesses. Nothing's impossible. You could be right. I don't mean to. I don't mean to completely discredit you, but I think what the far more likely situation is is Apple didn't feel like recording an event because a lot of these announcements are not that exciting. It's just like new chip, new iPad with new chip. 
And then maybe the OLED iPad Pro might be somewhat different, but I don't know. The dimensions leaked for it and it didn't sound that different. I'm pretty sure it might look kind of exactly the same as our existing iPad Pros, just with an OLED display and it's a little bit thinner. Um, I think the interface for Vision Pro is great for those people who are handicapped. I don't know. That's uh, It depends on the person, I guess. I know a lot of people with eye issues that said Vision Pro was basically unusable because it couldn't track their eyes properly. Um, but yeah, it depends on the person. depends on the disability. Would I ever review the Samsung Fold? I reviewed one before. <laughs> and my opinions on it haven't changed that much. How about the next one that comes out? I don't know. It's I don't think they've changed that much. I, I tried the, what do you call that? the hot dog folding style. Um, I didn't find it particularly interesting. I wasn't worried about the durability, but I just didn't think that the screen unlocked that much more usable space. And I found, and I've heard this from other people as well, I found that for most foldables, people don't unfold them. They tend to just use them folded up. I saw a guy the other day with a Z fold and he left it unfolded in his shirt pocket and then he moved it unfolded into his pocket. It's like people don't like extra steps, which is why I don't think foldables have caught on the way people thought they would have. You know, a lot of people acted like, oh, well, once they get cheaper, once they get better features, foldables will become the mainstream. And they really haven't. Uh, there's never been a folding phone that's come close to the top 10 best-selling phones in the world. Um, what's in regards to the Android space, what sells the best are the mid-range Androids. The flagship Android phones do not sell all that great, uh, which is funny because in the tech community, we give them so much attention. We act like they're the next big thing because it competes with the iPhone, but the iPhone sales are way up here. Galaxy S sales and Pixel sales are way down here. Um, the best-selling Galaxy phones are the A series, you know, the phones that cost like 400, 500 bucks. Um, and folding phones, even if they got down to there, I don't think would be as popular just because it's... It's not that there's something wrong with foldables. It's just the feature of folding in itself is not that it's not that great. I don't think it unlocks that much more practicality. It doesn't wow people as much as the tech community thought it would. Some people thought, ooh, this is going to make a big difference. Wow, oh my God, we can unfold them. But no, people got over it like that. It's like, oh, okay, it folds. That's not a feature. That's just a factoid. Um you should review the Quest 3. I'm thinking about it, honestly. My video, I, I compared the Quest 3 to the Apple Vision Pro. And I was very impressed with the hardware. And again, the Quest 3 is a much lower price. So if I, I don't know if I'm willing to go out and buy one. But if I were, I might I might consider a Quest 3 before I consider an Apple Vision Pro. Um, Vision Pro is like air travel compared to the Rode iPhone. Yeah, I think I think I agree. I think I know what you're saying. Foldables will only become mainstream if Apple releases one. Whatever Apple does, everybody else does. Well, pretty much everyone else has done it. It's just Apple that hasn't done it, right? But I do agree that if Apple made a foldable, yes, I do think it would be the best one because Apple gets software better than everyone. And more important than just the software experience, iOS is growing in market share anyway without folding phones. But... The point is, if we look at phones that sell well over $800, Apple is like 80% of the market. Apple has a monopoly, basically, on the premium smartphone space. And that's just another way of saying, when people spend a lot of money on a phone, they want it to be an iPhone. Most of the public, I know in the tech space, we have our little bubbles where we feel like everybody's buying Android phones left and right. But we are not like the masses. At least the global statistics are suggesting that if someone spends that kind of money on a phone, they want it to be an iPhone. So if there was to be a popular foldable, it would likely be an iPhone simply because uh, Apple could charge $2,000 for it and everybody would do it. <laughs> everybody would just be like, yep, done. Two grand, I can afford that. You know, that's just what people are used to with Apple. They have that much brand power. Uh, they have the reputation for being premium and people like their iPhones, so... I wish the Quest wasn't under Facebook too, honestly. I would I would be a lot more interested in the company if they weren't owned by Facebook. Dad says, I'm waiting for that thumb and pinky phone. That would sell big time. <laughs> Just like this, like Inspector Gadget. Um, 
Give me a new Apple TV and HomePod minis. More Apple TV features. Yeah, I should probably talk about that. My Apple TV has been sucking lately, but I'm not exactly sure whose fault it is. I don't know if it's the app developer's fault. We were trying to watch a movie on Max and it keeps like crashing or freezing up or something. We're like, the movie's playing, right? But it's not showing the subtitles like we want it to. We always want subtitles on and it turns them off. And I'm trying to use the Siri remote, which is fully charged and working, but it's not listening. Like I can't, I can't bring up the trackpad. I can't bring up anything, but I can click the volume and the volume adjusts. The volume's controlling the TV and the volume goes up and down so that the volume part's working, but the trackpad part isn't and the, the app becomes unresponsive even though it's still playing the movie. And that's happened several times now and I'm getting really annoyed whenever like part of the remote works and the other part of the remote doesn't work. Uh, Bart Jansen, thank you for the membership for 28 months. I should be sleeping right now, but whatever. Yeah, you should. Sleep is good for you. Don't mess around with sleep schedules. They can create lots of health problems if you have a bad sleep schedule. I know it's fun and the the relevant thing for all the youngins to brag about. Oh man, I stayed up all night. My sleep schedule sucks. Seriously, don't don't go around bragging like that like it's cool. I know people that do that. You don't even subcon you don't even consciously know that you're doing it. I know because I used to do this. I had a horrible sleep schedule. Um it's not good for you. The Max app is trash, absolutely. Do I upgrade to M2 or M3 MacBook Air for MacBook Pro Intel 2020? In my opinion, personal opinion, feel free to disagree. No one should buy the M3 MacBook Air. It is so absurdly close in design, in features, in performance to the M2 MacBook Air, which is objectively cheaper and has been out for a while, so you can find it on sale through third parties. Um, honestly, I would still recommend the M1 MacBook Air to a lot of people. M1 MacBook Air is still great. I know a lot of people that just need a laptop for some basic things. M1 chip is still perfectly fast. Um, great battery life. Honestly, the speakers I found on the M1 MacBook Air was better than the M2 and the M3. So I don't know exactly why you need an M2 or M3 MacBook Air, but you can find the M1 MacBook Air for like 700 bucks in a lot of places. Tech community hypes too much. Maybe I'm in the minority. I don't care for old... Uh, you mean, oh, you probably meant OLED or 120 hertz. Yeah, I agree. There's less things to care about because the more this, you know, smartphone and laptop technology, the more it improves, the smaller the differences become. It's the law of diminishing returns, which is why it's no wonder there's less people watching tech than they're used to. But that's why I'll be over on EV a lot. Um, let's see. I think everyone's take on Apple Vision Pro versus Quest 3 is wrong. Apple Vision Pro is way, way better, and it's not even close in terms of usability and smoothness. Quest 3 is extremely clunky. Reminds me of early iOS. Arvin Guy, let me just ask you. Have you used both for more than five minutes? Have you used both a Quest 3 and an Apple Vision Pro for more than five minutes? That's my one question. Because I have... And in my opinion, there's a lot of things the Quest 3 gets objectively better than the Apple Vision Pro. The field of view, the simplicity of putting it on. You don't have to walk through the stupid eye tracking thing. Controllers give you a lot more feedback for immersive experiences. And far more affordable, to be fair. And I don't know. I was just, I was super impressed with it. Okay, you do own both. Interesting, because I've tried both extensively, and I and I do not agree with you. But <laughs> you do you, man. Maybe maybe because you own both, that's how you justify it. Maybe your brain's like, I spent all this money on Apple Vision Pro. It has to be better, right? <laughs> Whereas I'm kind of like, yeah, I don't know. The, the difference between the two is pretty dang close. Also, the Quest Three doesn't require the cable going to a battery pack. You can just wear it. Honestly, felt a lot more futuristic to me to wear the Quest. Um, let's see. What about longevity? M2 Air is two years behind M3 Air. Would M2 stop updating two years earlier to M3? I don't think, if you're thinking about getting an M series of chip, uh, you're probably not going to keep the Mac that long anyway. <laughs> uh, if you're still rocking an Intel, I think, I think they'll both last a very, very long time. And the types of features we're talking about by then, where like, okay, one Mac gets eight years of support and another Mac gets six years of support, you're not going to be getting most of the new features anyway. 
You know, think about the software feature differences between the iPhone XS and the iPhone 11. Can you guys name things? If we compare the iPhone 11 to the XS in terms of software features, what is the 11 getting that the XS is not? Would you, okay, and then ask yourself this, when those six years go by, would you pay an extra $200 to unlock those features? Let's say it's a difference of, it's not this, but let's say it's the difference of live text or subject lift, little handy iOS features like that. Oh, I can pull up a picture and pull the text right off the photo, or I can pull up whatever. Um, I pull, I lift a subject out of any picture. Would you pay $200 to unlock those features? Probably not. Most people expect software updates for free. So if you wouldn't pay $200 for it, then why would you pay a $200 premium to have an M2 over an M1? Let's see. In a lot of ways, it does get these things better, similar to how Android has more features than iOS and always has. But do you not feel that the Quest 3 is extremely clunky? I have a lot of issues with glitching hands and moving stuff around in various... Yeah, the pass-through is not as good, but I would argue that... Most of the time I used Apple Vision Pro, I didn't want to use it with path with pass through because pass through got worse in low light environments. And in a lot of ways, I would say Apple Vision Pro is more clunky because it's heavier. It requires a cable going down to a big battery. So now I've got a battery to worry about and this big heavy headset to worry about. Um, so in many ways, I would argue that Vision Pro is more clunky. The software is more smooth and seamless on Apple Vision Pro, but it felt more natural and much, much easier to use the Quest 3. I just picked it up and put it on. That was it. There was no like battery to keep track of and cable routing through my hair and all that. Um, very easy to share too. You could just hand the Quest 3 to someone else and they put it on and now they're using it. Whereas Apple Vision Pro, it's like, okay, hold down the digital crown. Now look here, now look here, now look here, now look here. And then you have to do that 18 times every time someone else puts it on. It's a huge pain in the butt. I found that very clunky compared to the Quest where my friend who had the Quest 3 could just hand it to me and go, here you go, try it. I had, I had played, what did Mike use as the example? Mike mentioned, I had played an entire round of Beat Saber, probably more than one. I had played two full rounds of Beat Saber by the time Mike had gotten through the eye calibration process of Apple Vision Pro. And because he's not the authorized user, every time he takes it off and puts it back on, he has to go through all that setup all over again. To me, that's clunky. I think that's a bit clunky. Um, let's see. Moving stuff. In it, I'm an XR programmer, and when I use Apple Vision Pro, I feel inspired by the future of tech. But on the Quest 3, I'm like, yeah, this is too clunky for mainstream. Yeah, but Vision Pro is way too expensive for mainstream, too. So they, you pick your poison. <laughs> I think, I think they're both good, honestly. They're both very impressive pieces of hardware. It's just amazing to me that a Quest 3 is the seventh of the price, and it is not a seventh of the capability at all. Um, M3 MacBook Pro will support dual screen as well. Yeah, I saw that. I pinned it on the video comment. I don't know why they're so picky about external monitors. There's older computers that have so many external monitor support, but whatever. Um Good night, Bart Jensen. Hope you sleep well. Just because iPhone people are in a red Samsung Z series, Google Fold is mainstream. Uh, okay. Believe what you want to believe, but that's not what the data says. Uh, do I think Mac OS will have an AI chat like Windows 11? Have you seen the new Surface Pro rumors? Would you review one? I am not a particularly big fan of Windows. I, I've used Windows in the past and I never really liked it, so... If it brought a lot of attention to my channel, I would probably do it. But every time I try to, it doesn't perform all that great. So I just don't think people look at me for the Windows reviews because they know it's going to be this whole Apple Sheep perspective and people don't want that, I guess. So I'm fine with that. I don't need to test it out. If I got a lot of people asking me to check it out, then maybe I would. But you're like the first person to ask me that in probably a year. Um. M3 does come in a new coating. I'll save you the trouble. Don't get that color. Just get the silver. It ages the best. You're not going to think about the color when you're using your laptop. Midnight is fingerprinty on the M3 and on the M2. It's less fingerprinty on the M3, but it's still fingerprinty. Better off just getting a lighter shade. Much better off. Just get a normal color. 
You you wouldn't spend two hundred dollars to have a slightly less fingerprinty laptop, would you? Would you pay someone two hundred dollars to wipe the fingerprints off your laptop? No, I don't think so. AR and VR both won't really ever be mainstream due to price, but also because it's inherently not a shared experience. It can get there. Come on. Think a little broader than that, Brian. You can have two people wearing the headset and looking at the same thing together. We're just not there yet. It takes time. You could say the same thing about the iPhone when it originally came out. It won't be, ex it, it's too expensive to go mainstream. $500 fully subsidized. Um, these things don't happen overnight. Apple Vision Pro literally came out like a month ago, guys. Like, don't don't expect it to replace everything and take over the world in one month. The original iPhone didn't have a front-facing camera. You couldn't take selfies. You couldn't take videos with the first iPhone. You couldn't change the wallpaper. Look at how far it's come. We've got a lot of improvement to improve. Lots of share play potential. I'm sure we'll probably even hear more about that at Dub Dub. But anyway, I got to get going. I appreciate all you channel members for supporting directly and people just watching. Seriously, helps me out a ton. Helps me out with this dream job, which is not a guarantee, but I appreciate every day that I have it. So thank you all for tuning in. Hope you have an excellent rest of your day. Bye-bye.